Hello, everybody. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada, and welcome to our special edition masterclass featuring award winning DGC director Matt Gallagher and his new film, Dispatches from a Field Hospital. This event marks one year since the global lockdown, and I can't imagine a more appropriate way for us to wrap our heads around that extraordinary fact than talking about this amazing film and the incredible people and stories it contains. A very personal shout out to those who open their lives and hearts on camera to share their stories to enlighten and embolden us. And my admiration to the courage and unbelievable skill above and beyond the call of duty that the healthcare workers demonstrate. I hope many of you tuning in had a chance to watch the film before tonight. If not, the link we sent you is active until midnight tonight or watch it next Tuesday night at 9 p.m. when it premieres on TVO. We're very fortunate to have Nam Kiwanuka as our moderator tonight. Nam is a multi-platform journalist, host and producer. She's the co-host of The Agenda with Steve Pakin, Ontario's leading primetime daily current affairs show and host of The Agenda in the summer on TVO. She's hosted magazine shows for the NBA and CFL and was even a much music VJ and videographer. She's worked with CNN and BET and was a columnist for the BBC's Focus on Africa magazine. Our featured director tonight, Matt Gallagher, has been directing and shooting feature documentaries and series for 20 years. His stories have brought him far and wide, embedding him in the diverse worlds of priests, prisoners, and poker players, and now doctors, to name a few. Matt's documentaries are character-driven narratives that explore both the struggles and the triumphs of the human condition. Previous to Dispatches, Matt's most recent feature release, Prey, won the Rogers Audience Award and DGC Jury Prize at Hot Docs 2019. Prey continued to screen and collect awards at festivals around the world and was nominated for Best Feature Documentary at the Canadian Screen Awards and the DGC's Alan King Award. Tonight, we're also very fortunate to have a very special guest from the film who will be joining us a bit later in the conversation. Before I bring in Matt and Nam, for those who didn't have a chance to watch the film, let's roll the trailer. It has been five weeks since the first case of COVID-19. The latest figure... 28 patients have already checked in at this temporary field hospital at the Sportsplex at St. Clair College. Oh, hi, Matt. Hey, Mom. We're out front. We want to record one of your calls with Dad at the field hospital. You see me? Never. I sent you a nice letter. Did you? You want to listen to the letters I wrote you? Yeah. Dear Maury, I'm sitting on our swing in the backyard and it seems everything reminds me of you. So many memories. It was fast moving, getting everything set up and function like a hospital unit would. Everything had to be kind of coordinated and come together within a very short time frame. The fear and the anxiety was palpable. And I just remember looking at everybody and you could see the fear on everybody. They just had no idea what was coming to us. Ultimately, he would love to see the point where uh, you come out of the hospital and uh, we hug each other. I don't know how I could get you. So far, nobody's left. <coughs> a few have died, but nobody's left. All right, we got your family on the line. Oh my God. Oh, look at all your pictures. Mm -hmm. Tell them what you did today. Tell them how you won at bingo twice. How much did you win? Some Timbit. Oh, wow. A little bit of a cinnamon bun. Yeah. <laughs> On that iPad, you might be able to get some news because I know you always love your news. You always read the newspaper. You don't want to know what's going on? Nope. No news is good news. Okay. Especially during a pandemic, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Normally, our patients, their families are at the bedside holding that vigil, being able to hold their loved one's hands, and, and that's kind of a heart-wrenching 
reality of this pandemic is that that part of this journey was really not possible. You know, telling him how much we loved him right there in person. You know, instead it was through this modern day abstraction of the, the computer. You're a great guy too, Dad. I love you. Thanks. We're going to get you out of there soon. All right. Amazing. Please welcome Matt Gallagher and Nam Kiwanuka. Come on in, guys. Hi, everybody. Matt, I have to say, I kind of dig that uh, virtual audience. That's pretty <laughs> yeah. awesome. I thought um, it was a real thing. <laughs> um, everyone that's uh, joining us tonight, thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction, Hans. And everybody who's watching, thank you for spending your Friday night with us. Uh, it means a lot. Um, this uh, documentary will be airing on TVO, and it's going to be premiering on Tuesday, March 16th. And it is part of TVO's Inside Stories, a year of COVID series. Um, as I said, it starts on March 16th and continues on March 17th. 18th uh, and 20th at 9 p.m. And dispatches will also repeat Saturday at 10.30 and Sunday at 10.30. And you can also watch 24-7 online at tvo.org and TVO uh, Docs YouTube channel starting Tuesday night. So hi, Matt. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Nam. Um, I, I, I watch this. Guys, just one second, Nam. Yeah. Sorry, before I hand it over to you, I just want to let the audience know about the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, that's where uh, those of you tuning in can type your questions in. Matt's, Nam's going to be watching that button for all your questions throughout the evening. Uh, she'll try to get to as many as she can. She may not get to all of them, uh, but she will certainly make an effort. So type them in there uh, throughout. Um, really looking forward to this, guys. That's it for me. I'll see you at the end. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, so like I said, this uh, documentary was... Um, so powerful, Matt. And I thought that I, I, people who are who've already watched it want to know um, how you did it, how you got to the story. So I thought we could break it up into four parts, uh, the process, the stories, um, the front line, and looking forward. And then we do have a special guest coming uh, up in a little bit. So let's start, let's start at the beginning. How did you come to tell the story? Uh, I mean, the story started completely different uh, than how the film ended up. I mean, I'm a, I've am been living in Toronto for 20 years, but I'm, I'm, I'm still a Windsorite. I was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario. And so I, I tend to um, do a lot of documentaries that, uh, that uh, I end up going back to Windsor for. And so uh, right around the start of the pandemic, we started to hear about this Windsor Field Hospital that was being built. And, and, and you know, in a matter of uh, a week or two, uh, they transformed the, uh, the St. Clair College Sportsplex into a field hospital. I mean, it was it was just like you saw in the documentary, all the all the all the material with walls and white and and high tech equipment. And and so as soon as I, I, I saw that this was happening, I thought to myself, that's an interesting documentary in itself. I mean, you know, this is how uh, Windsor, Ontario is, is, is responding very quickly to the pandemic. And, 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 and I had heard of other field hospitals around the world, you know, in New York and, and, and places like that. And, and I thought to myself, you know, if I can get access into that field hospital and you know, embed myself with a with a camera and a and a sound guy and a, you know a production assistant, just a very tiny crew. We could we could tell a powerful story of the doctors and the and the nurses and the staff who were making that place happen. And so, um, you know, I had this you know this idea of this documentary where you're sort of like this war journalist and you're embedded into a into a battle. And, and so I, I, I sort of reached out to uh, David Muje, who's the CEO of, of Windsor Regional Hospital, and he's responsible for 
um, what happened with, with, with the field hospital. And, and I reached out to him and I explained what I wanted to do, what I was hoping to do. And, and, and we had a couple conversations, but it, it became <laughs> clear pretty early in those conversations that it was just, no, uh, I'm sorry, Matt, that it just can't happen. Because? Uh, yeah, yeah, because we're in a pandemic and, and, and the field hospital is gonna be caring for you know, people with COVID-19 and we don't even know what this is yet. And, and, and we know that the families aren't even gonna be allowed to visit these patients. And so, um, you know, he, he, was, he was very sort of, uh, you know, interested and supportive of, you know, doing a documentary, but he just said, maybe you should think about it a bit. And so uh, the producer and I, Cornelia, we just sort of parked the idea. I, I, I sort of, you know, I mean, documentaries are about access and, and, and getting access to, to a place like that is, is paramount in, in being able to tell that story. So we sort of parked the idea and we didn't even think about it. Um, and then COVID started to, COVID-19 hit my family. Uh, the first was my Aunt Virginia. Uh, uh, Aunt, Aunt Virginia McCloskey died um, uh, in, in, the, in the early days of COVID-19. And she, she lived down the hallway from my father at, at this nursing home in Windsor, Ontario. And so, so we were just reeling with that. And then, and then my dad got it. Uh, and so we were just reeling with the death of Aunt Virginia. And, and now my dad uh, not only had COVID-19, but he was being sent to that very field hospital, the, the very same field hospital. And so, you know, I was in conversation with my family and my mom and, and my sisters and my brother, and we were talking about dad and, and what we're going to do. And we were all worried and concerned. And, and, I, and I wasn't even thinking about a documentary at that point. Um, uh, you know, I, I was, I was, you know, we, you know, we were, we were more worried about dad, but my mother was, uh, you know, she's, she's very, uh, she's very optimistic about life and, 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 and what happens in life. And, and she said, well, the good thing is, is that I actually get to talk to him every day and I'm talking to the doctors every day and there's all this kinds of communication. And, and I started to hear more about this and, and I, and I, and I learned later that, um, someone from Windsor had donated, uh, you know, a bunch of iPads to the field hospital and they were, and they had iPads in, in uh, every patient's room and those iPads were used to communicate with the families. And, and so I spoke with the producer, Cornelia, and we, we, we were, we were, we sort of wondered, I mean, could you do a documentary on, on these communications? I mean, could you, could, could you tell a story, a powerful story about what was happening in the field hospital without ever stepping foot inside the field hospital. And so I talked to my mom and, and, and dad and, and, and uh, you know, my, my mom agreed that, uh, you know, it, it, it could be a good story. And she, she allowed me to, to film and, and but, but we had to sort of um, pitch it to a broadcaster. And so the, our first stop was TV Ontario. So you, so you told me um, a very interesting story. You said that when you did approach TVO, uh, you pitched it, you actually wanted them to say no. So yeah. why would you pitch it if you <laughs> wanted to no? know? Well, because, you know, sometimes, you know, like, you know, there's documentaries in life that you really want to make. And there's, and there's stories that, you know, you work on for years and years and years. And, and this wasn't one of those stories. This is a story that dropped in, in dropped into our lives and dropped into our lives very hard. And, and I didn't know how the story was going to end. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I didn't want to tell the story of, of, my, of my dad possibly you know, dying. And so, you know, um, but that being said, I, I, you know, it's, it's, like when it went, it's, it's like when I make these documentaries, I'm, I'm, I'm always asking people to, to tell their stories, you know, and, and, and I'm always asking people to tell their stories in the worst possible time of their lives like whether it's a documentary on on uh, sexual abuse or a documentary about uh, you know going to prison i'm 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 asking people to share their stories to sort of shine a light on on how things work and and so i i sort of i i felt uh, you know somewhat compelled a bit of you know slightly compelled and and a, and a sort of a responsibility to to tell the story if if my parents wanted me to tell that story so when we pitched it to tvo um you know, we pitched it with all our heart and, and, but when we finished the meeting on the, on the drive home, I said to Cornelia, I said, I hope they say no. And, and, she, and she agreed, but, uh, but they said yes. <laughs> and they said, um, yeah. So uh, was part of the, um, not wanting them to say yes, in the sense that you said that you speak to people, their worst uh, moments in life. 
this is um, your one of your, you know, at that point, you didn't know what was going to happen to your father. Uh, your aunt had just died. It was in a way, the trepidation around maybe becoming story um, when you're usually behind the camera? Um, Nam, I lost about the first three quarters of that question. Can you restate that? Oh, you that? did? <laughs> of course right. you did. Right. Zoom! Yeah. <laughs> I was saying that um, was a part of you um, being uh, part of the trepidation about, you know, you said that you usually talk to people at the worst uh, moments in their lives. Your aunt had just died. Your dad had COVID. No one knew what was coming next. Uh, what you uh, because you would be part of the story um, and you would become part of the story that you were telling when usually you're behind the camera. Sorry, Nam, I'm still missing that last part of the question. <laughs> the critical part. Oh, I, gosh. I got, okay, which part did you get? I, I got as far as um, uh, you're, you're, you, you like tell stories about uh, people and it's difficult and, and, and then... Okay, was part of the trepidation that you would become part of the story? Definitely. I mean... Um, you know, I, I mean, I knew that when my mother agreed to us, uh, you know, taping and filming her phone calls that we were going to be in the film. Um, so I knew that was, uh, going to be part of the story. I just, you know, I, I, I don't think I was prepared or in fact, I know I wasn't prepared to, 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 to film this story had it gone another way. And so I, I yeah, I was, I was, I was frightened, but we 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 sort of were busy we 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 went to work and we just showed up every day and started you know filming these these phone calls with my mother um and i guess eventually you did get a yes from the hospital because you did end up shooting there well the hospital didn't let us in the entire time that the patients were there mm -hmm. um we still couldn't get access to the hospital which 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 was fine so um the hospital was operational with uh, covid 19 patients from heron terrace I think I think I worked it out to about fifty-seven days, just shy of uh, two, just shy of two months, mm -hmm. and so we filmed on the outside for those fifty-seven days. Um, but there was a there was sort of a, a, a you know a lull in between the first wave and the second wave at the end of the summer, uh, and and they had shut the field hospital down. All the patients were gone, and it was sitting there empty, mm -hmm. um, and that was the point where where I reached out to the hospital. Um, uh, people again and, and, and I talked to David Muje and, and I said, you know, it'd be great if I could, you know, interview the staff who, who were, who were, who took care of my dad and took care of all the other patients there. And so um, uh, we started to, you know, uh, uh, choose the staff to come back one, to come back one at a time to this place that they worked at for, for a couple months. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, and we sat them down for a couple hours and had these amazing interviews. Um, you know, you started filming this in April. This was when the pandemic was new. And we weren't even sure whether or not we should sanitize our groceries, for example. Um, how did you approach filming uh, with keeping safe as the information around COVID evolved? Yeah, I mean, things were changing constantly, but um, our producer Cornelia uh, sort of uh, by, by talking with doctors and, and people in the production community, we, we developed very quickly a, a protocol and, and the protocol you know, evolved over time, but in the beginning, you know, as you said, we were in a we we were in the stages where um, they weren't even, you know, pe people were saying uh, don't even uh, wear N95 masks because you're stealing them from the frontline workers, and so so we were still at, at that at that sort of stage. So so we had you know strict protocols with filming that we that that we never entered somebody's house. Um, we we uh, we never used body microphones. Uh, there was no touching, you know. So um, so like normally when you're filming these documentaries, you can put a wireless pack on somebody and, and let them go. But we didn't do any of that. So everything was mic'd from afar, mm -hmm. and we used a lot of wireless mics and 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 we sanitized every piece of equipment that 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 was exchanged between the crew, or or went into a home and 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 we sort of uh, you know it it was it was slow going, but. Um, it it, uh, it it was the only way we could safely film a documentary because what I was worried about, um, you know, when I'm making these documentaries, uh, I'm 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 sort of I've I've always <laughs> I had 
couple incidents early where in my career where you know somebody almost got hurt and so uh, I've developed a very you know stringent uh, sort of protocol when we're working like I want everyone to go home with all their fingers and toes at the end of the day so that's the most important thing. I was going to ask you that too because I think um, everybody's nerves were on edge and we didn't really understand because at the time it was just evolving um, um, almost on a daily basis was that front of mind every day that you were in the field filming? Yeah, yeah, and 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 my 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 ultimate biggest fear was being responsible through filming with the spread of a virus. You know, it, you know, I, I I can't imagine, you know, spreading a virus to somebody who I'm filming with who's who's already going through so much. So so we were we were very very careful, and and uh, and thankfully nothing happened. So, how did you decide on who which patients to profile? Well, all of the patients at the field hospital came from one nursing home. It's my dad's nursing home. It's called Heron Terrace. It's on the East End of Windsor. And, and so um, my dad's been there for a couple of years now. And so I had a relationship with a few of them. Um, I had already known uh, Vince and I had already known Nora. And, and so um, it, it was easy for me to reach out to their families. Um, there were uh, there there like was one family in there the Chignowski family who uh, Mr. Dan Chignowski, yeah Dan Dan unfortunately died at the field hospital but um, I've been friends with that family for 25 years they grew up uh, you know a few blocks away from where 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 I grew up on in, in uh, Windsor so so uh, some of the stories um, were were from people that I already knew uh, and then some of the stories were just um, by sort of word of mouth I mean and we and we had an associate producer uh, named Pat Jefflin who was on the ground in Windsor and she was, you know, you know, talking to people and reaching out. And, and I mean, that was the hard thing is sort of getting access to these stories because as I mentioned before, this is, this is, you know, likely the most challenging part of these people's lives and, 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 and people are busy and, and they don't want to, you know, I'm scared. People are scared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to incorporate some of the questions coming in on the sure. chat. Um, I'm not sure if I should say people's names, if they want me to say their names. Um, I'll just say the first name. Um, Melissa asks, did people give permission to use their conversations with their family members on the iPads? Were they pre-warned or asked first? Yeah, in, yeah, entirely. So, so uh, uh, the Windsor Regional Hospital has a strict policy, obviously, for privacy, especially when it comes to, um, you know, uh, you know, what 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 they do, and and definitely when it's dealing with documentaries and media and things like that. So every person um, um, either had to sign off personally, or their power of attorney had to sign off, and so we had to go through all of that very carefully. And um, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, for TVO, we're not allowed to use an, an image or a voice of of anybody who hasn't given us permission. So so we were very very careful with that before we even started filming with them. Um, one patient, uh, Nora, uh, has a son and he visits her and he says um, in the documentary that he can't, he can't wait for one day to be able to take her to the dollar store because that's her favorite place. Um, and they have a tradition of always getting ice cream. So he can't wait for that, for them to be able to do that. Um, at one point, she says, um, I don't know if I'll ever get out of here. So far, no one has left. Knowing this and having a, a parent in that environment, how did you not lose hope with your dad's situation? Yeah, it it I I I remember when um, her son, uh, you know, gave me that that uh, Skype call with his mother, and that was one of the first calls he had with his mother. Where our 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 production was able to provide um, iPads to the loved ones on the outside, so we could so we could actually you know ask for them to communicate with them and record them. But so he had sent me a, a, a recorded Skype call, and it was one of the first calls he had with his mother and and Nora. Yeah, Nora. I've 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 known Nora for a few years now because she's always out in front of Heron Terrace and she's out there with her little scooter and she and she feeds the squirrels. She always has a, a bag of nuts on, on the scooter and and whenever I go to visit my dad or when I did go visit my dad, um, I'd bring the dog and she loves dogs and she would always have a dog a bag of dog cookies and feed and, and to, to like feed my dog. So so but when 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 I saw Nora, who was this vibrant woman, the last time I saw her. And then I saw her on that Skype call. I it uh, broke my heart. I mean, she was um, she was in pain, and and she was talking to her son like like 
like they weren't going to see each other again. And so she was talking about things that a parent might talk to their child about, about things about regrets and things about, you know, I wish I could have and things like that. And, and it was, it was, it was heartbreaking. And, 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 and there was this moment in the, in the, um, in the Skype call between her and her son, where they said their good, uh, they said their goodbyes and, 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 and he clicked his monitor off yeah. and she, and or she could click her monitor off. You could see her like turn away and she, she didn't want to show her son the pain that she was in, but you know, the camera was still on and you could see it, you know, so she was in great pain. So seeing that um, one made me feel horrible for Nora, but uh, two made me feel, you know, horrible for my dad and wondering what's going to happen. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about that scene because it's um, it's actually stayed with me because when they're doing when they're on the Skype and they're talking, uh, he, he was making jokes later on. Uh, one of the jokes he said to her, and I'm probably going to tell it wrong. He said, you know, mom, last night I dreamt that I was a muffler. And she's like, huh? And then he said, oh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> but they, you know, they're having these like light conversations. Um, and then he, the Skype goes off on his end. And then she just grimaces in pain. Mm -hmm. um, there's being like, you had lost your auntie. Um, your dad was ill. And when you, and it's interesting, you said that when Nora and her son were speaking, it was like the last time that they were, uh, talking to each other. I also got the sense with your dad and yourself, because your dad would say that I'm very proud of you. Um, it was as if he was saying goodbye. Did you, did you feel like that's what he was um, feeling? Um, and were you also feeling the same thing that you might not be able to, you might not see him again? I think, I think that, I think that I felt better right away as soon as I saw him on the first Skype call. I remember, you know, I remember when my dad went in there, um, I was worried, you know, cause I'd been, you know, listening to the news and, and hearing what's going on in New York. And, 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 and I tend to uh, worry too much sometimes. And I, and I, and I was worried that this was going to be my dad's last moment. And, and I, and we, and we weren't going to see him again. And I, I didn't know how sick he was. Mm -hmm. um, but when I actually was able to get that first zoom call with him, or the Skype call, uh, I could see that, oh, he's, he's actually, he's actually okay. I mean, he's, 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 he's not coughing and he looks pretty good. He's got, I mean, I mean, the worst thing I could say is that he's got long hair, but, <laughs> but so, yeah, so we, so we were lucky. And, and so that's why I think those, 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 that, those, those uh, dispatches, those, the, that video communication was so important because without that, I mean, sure, we would have got reports from the doctor and the hospital and things like that, but to, to actually, see you know your loved one there and to sort of realize okay i he looks pretty good and he's still he's still got a positive attitude and and he seems to be enjoying himself i mean you know as as i as i as i started to interview all these doctors and and uh, i started to realize that 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 it you know i mean i mean i didn't know very much about the hospital i, I mean all i saw from the hospital you know, during that those first two months was through a through a, through a screen. But mm -hmm. when I started to interview the doctors and, and sort of find out that there was so much going on there, I, I you know it, it was it was like I, I like realized that it was the best place for my dad. Um, initially, when your mom was trying to connect with your dad, uh, they were they were trying to do it on the phone, but uh, technology uh, wasn't working. And I think at one point, it's funny you mentioned the hair because your mom said something about uh, your dad looking like a hippie, like you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not, not my words. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there were moments when your mom, when you're interviewing your mother um, and she gets emotional while you're interviewing her. How did you refrain from um, going to her? How did you refrain yourself from going to her and comforting her? How yeah. did you stop? You know? Yeah, that, I mean, that's 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 hard i mean it's it's like uh because your nature is when you see somebody that you love in in in, in distress you 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 go and you comfort them but we couldn't we we we, we couldn't we, we 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 couldn't give someone a hug and so i mean the closest i could come to comfort is is you know i, I think i think there's a moment where my mom's telling me this story and 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 i and i just say i'm sorry i mean like there's there's, there's nothing more you 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 can do you know yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was hard, but I think my mother, I think my mother, um, 
you know, I think I think just having us there in a strange way was 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 a good thing for her and, and for me too. Um, another family that you mentioned was um, the one uh, uh, Dan who died. Uh, they you filmed them and they're having an online vigil. And one of the children says that it was actually a gift to be able to say goodbye this way. Um, she says, we were with him constantly and in, a and in a regular hospital, we wouldn't have been able to gather together so quickly to be with him um, as a family. Did that surprise you? Yeah, um, the, the entire Chignowski family surprised me. I mean, I thought, I mean, I, I knew that their dad was in there and I first read about their story uh, the the uh, the Windsor Star had posted an article on 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 their story, and uh, so I reached out to them. Um, and this was you know weeks or months after their father had passed, but they you know you know the daughters were were felt really good. You know they 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 they, they saw this marathon communications you know this Zoom call that like went on for four or five days as. As, as something that wouldn't have happened, you know, they like wouldn't have been able to spend that much time with their father, you know, so they, they, they had a, they had an, they had an approach to, they had a, like a sort of a view on how their dad passed that was surprising to me. Um, Cause in a way it was kind of, um, I think the past year people have been trying to find silver linings um, just in this new normal that just has all of us on edge would you say that that was kind of like a silver lining um, in this horrific situation? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I just think that, you know, I've, I've, I've known Mr. Chignowski who passed, I've known him uh, for 20 years. Um, he was actually in one of my first TVO documentaries. <laughs> like uh, he's, he's a, he's a, he, among other things, he 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 was an actor, a, a Windsor a Windsor actor, and so I so our, our paths crossed many many times, but um, yeah, I th I, th I think I think I think it was I think it was a positive thing. I mean, w one of his daughters, um, I think it was Tatiana, said said to me, and we didn't include it in the film, but I remember her line. It was it was she was laughing because she was telling me that, you know if her dad could know that we were making a documentary about him after he died, he would love it, <laughs> he would, you know? And, and so it was, it was just this nice sort of uh, shout out to Mr. C. It was really nice too with the music, um, but his son was having a really hard time not being able to physically be there with his father and, and to be able to touch him. What impact did that have on the patients and the families that you interviewed not being able to physically touch their loved ones, especially when they pass? Yeah, touch touch was something that surprised me. I I started to interview um, people in the film, and uh, one of the people that I interviewed, um, Bonnie, her 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 brother Vince was at the field hospital, and Bonnie's the Italian. Bonnie's Bonnie's the uh, the the like one who 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 talks about her brother, and she talks about being Italian and how we're Italian and we touch each other, and we hug each other, and and she started to talk about touch, and 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 she was one of the first interviews I had. And I remember thinking to myself, like it, it's it surprised me just the physical part of how how important that is. So after that interview uh, with Bonnie, I, I ended up um, um, asking everybody about it, and everybody had their thoughts on it. And then so so touch touch became a very important part of the film. I mean that's why the last I mean I mean I mean the last frame in the film is 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 my dad reaching over and touching my mom's hand. You know. So. Mm. Um, I want to go to some of the. Um... Uh, questions and <laughs> I feel like a, a mad scientist with all these boxes. <laughs> um, there is a question about uh, filming, so let's just take a step back. Uh, yep. This is from Peter, and he wants to know: Was the crew your bubble for the fifty-seven days of shooting near the field hospital and beyond, or did you, or did you break up the shooting, then quarantine, then dive back in, then quarantine? So we 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 essentially had a bubble, um, it was just, it was, I mean, on the ground every day, there was just three of us. And then sometimes there was four, but uh, you know, we couldn't even stay in this. I mean, we, we didn't share production vehicles. We all drove our own vehicles. We, we stayed in our own hotel rooms. And, and so we, we sort of, um, you know, we, we would show up on a shoot and then we'd go back to our regular places and then that'd be that. So yeah, so we had our little bubble 
Um, and then part of the protocol, if I recall, that after we finished that, that one month or two month period, we had to go back to our homes and, 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 and I think the producer worked into the budget where we had to quarantine ourselves for like two weeks. Yeah, so it was, it was um, you know, we, we, we uh, took it seriously. Um, we now have a special guest. Uh, Dr. Chevalier was the lead physician at the Field Hospital. Uh, Dr. Chevalier, can, um, welcome. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you great. Thank you so much for joining us. Did I say your name correctly? Chevalier, that's correct. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, so you were the first doctor at the field hospital. Can you t take us back to those early days? How would you describe those early days? Oh my, well, um, in the beginning, um, as Matt said, we have to go back to you know where we were in April. Um, we didn't know very much. We were we uh, were watching a lot of media. We were seeing what was happening in New York and in uh, Italy. Um, so you know our knowledge is very different now than it was back then. So um, you know we came together very quick as a group of healthcare professionals um, to uh, to man the field hospital, if you would. Um, and there was a lot of unknowns. We really didn't know what was going to be coming at us um, as far as the patients, how sick they would be. Um, you know, we were seeing a lot of tragedy in uh, Italy and in, in, in New York. And, you know, we really weren't sure if that's what we were going to see, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I um, call hospital the St. Clair facility, but you insisted it be called a field hospital. Um, how come? Uh, well, I felt strongly. I felt like at that time, um, you know, we were really feeling like as if we were going into a lot of unknown and, and truly um, felt like we were, you know, going to battle, if you would, um, and going to a war on our own. Uh, and it only seemed fitting. Uh, people were, uh, you know, we had, we had a lot of unknowns. We were, uh, you know, using a lot of our courage, a lot of team building to pull us all together very quickly as a, as a big group. Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, to, to do what we could do. Uh, so it felt it felt appropriate to call it a field hospital, like you would in 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 war. You were at the front lines um, of this. You are at the front lines of this. Um, during those early days when the news was happening around the world and we were seeing what was happening in places like Italy in Wuhan, um, how were were you frightened? Uh, I think we were all frightened to some degree. Um, I think we were all, I would say, a courageous group. Um, and uh, I think we gathered strength um, from one another, for sure. Uh, we met as a day. We went over our, our, our fears, if you would, um, the unknown to troubleshoot and solve problems that we had that cropped up that you couldn't plan for in a field hospital. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we all had our small fears. We had some of us living in trailers on our front yard. Some of them were... Some of our staff were living in hotels away from their families. And uh, uh, I would definitely say there's certainly an element of fear. Um, and I think you settled in. I don't like what Matt said, though. In the beginning, I think there was a lot of fear. And then you settle into your job and you just, you know, you just do what you know how to do. Um, and for us, that's to care for patients. Do you kind of go into autopilot? A little bit, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, when the patients uh, from Heron Trials came to the field hospital, they must have been terrified. Uh, how did you make them feel safe and at home? Uh, well, uh, I think, um, well, there's a couple of different ways. They, we actually had some of the staff come uh, with them from Heron Terrace um, to uh, familiarize themselves with, with where they were. So there was a friendly face, if you would, uh, for them, somewhat a familiar face. Um, and then we as a group kind of worked with the handover with that crew that came uh, and delivered their patients to us, if you would. We made some nice signs outside every patient when it was posted up on the wall. We just taped it up to the wall um, that kind of outlined, you know, for example, Matt, Dad, we called him coach. So we put that up, you know, right there. We knew, you know, who his wife was. We knew, uh, you know, what his favorite things were to do. What do you like to talk about? What is favorite foods were, what was important to him. Um, so we had those posted right at the wall. So anybody walking into a room um, could easily see that quickly and, and you know, adapt quickly. 
um because matt's dad was a football coach right that's right yeah, yeah. yeah. um tell me about bingo day oh gosh so bingo <laughs> day came later on in our later on in our journey actually at the field hospital and patients were starting to to get better actually um and uh, so they could get out, we could get them all up into their chairs and they could get out into this long area, um, kind of like a hallway, if you would. And, you know, we would line them all up. And uh, Jackson, one of our staff, uh, uh, he was the bingo caller and, uh, and we played bingo in the afternoon. It was really, it was great fun, actually. It was great fun. It was um, a fun time to see people smile and enjoy and, uh, share good stuff together out of their rooms because they were starting to get better right um we have a comment in the uh, question and answer chat and annie says please tell dr chevalier that the daily phone calls from the doctor along with the ipad contact with our loved ones quite literally kept families sane thank you so much no oh, she's very you're very welcome annie we are happy to do that um it was uh we were we were all as a group very committed to making sure that everybody felt like they could hear as much about what was going on. We called every single day, multiple times a day. That was um, it was a very fearful time for patients and their families. When you hear um, a, a, a comment like that, um, how does that make you feel? Oh, it warms my heart. It makes me feel like. Um, you know, uh, that we did a good job and that families were appreciative and, uh, and then we did, we did, you know, what we could to make an awful situation, um, as, I guess, as good as we could do at the time. Um, now, when you look back, because I, I think a lot of us um, uh, are still quite shocked that we're still neck deep in this uh, a year later, we have learned a lot. Uh, vaccines are here. Um, but when you look back, what impact did those early days have on you as a physician? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a big question. Uh, and I think it's hard, actually, for me almost to answer because so much has gone on in this last year. Sure. I can certainly say from my experience at the field hospital, um, I, uh, I, I had a... It, 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 um, it's a, it was a remarkable experience. Um, I think that um, any one of us would would go back um, and do it again if we had if we were asked to or we needed to. Um, I think that the sense of team uh, was unbelievable from the ground. You have to remember there was a whole group of us. Men, some of us knew each other from different areas of the hospital, but as a team, we had never worked together. Uh, and so that was a remarkable experience. In that, you know, I was invited um, or asked to to come on the Wednesday, so that would have been April the 15th, um, that this was going to happen. So I showed up April the 15th, this was going to happen. The next day, we, you know, we sat down and had a sense, toured the place, if you would, and figured out how we were going to staff it. And then we got patients the next day. So we didn't have a lot of time to pull together. I mean, we had a skill set in one other. We had to walk through. We were still constructing in some ways, putting up safety barriers for patients. So I think the biggest thing is how fast a team can come together when you need it. And when you mm -hmm. have such a, a goal, of this, the goal for us was to try and help curb the infection at Heron Terrace and help as many patients survive this as we could and make it as, I guess, as gentle a process for their families um, that was we and and that, I think that it strikes me how quickly we were able to come together as a team and do that. Well, um, Sunnybrook is establishing a field hospital in anticipation of the third wave in Toronto. Knowing that your hospital was the first of its kind in Canada, how does it feel to know that you played a role in helping with the data, with the science? Oh, that makes you you you. you that's a lovely feeling. Makes you very proud to have been part of. And you know, like we said the very first day, guys, we're all, this is part of history. We're making history here. So, and we were all proud to be part of it. We are happy to be part of it. Um, Matt, I wanted, there's a question. I'm gonna go back into the question yep. and answer. We have a few questions here. Um, Shelby says, as much as the phrase living in history can be applied to so many scenarios, the COVID-19 pandemic feels like one of the most momentous occasions in the last 20 years. Can you speak to being a documentarian during this time? And was there uh, a certain pressure of capturing the experience 
and a way to preserve it for many years to come. Yeah, there was there was there was all kinds of pressure. I mean, we were you know after we got the green light from TDO, we we uh, started shooting the next day, and we didn't have anything. We we didn't have any stories. We didn't have you know, but but I I just started slowly and started to sort of archive these stories, and and, and so that 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 was my intention is is that is that I is that I is that I knew I wasn't going to get access inside the field hospital to film it as as the things were happening in there. So. My goal was just to uh, uh, is just to do a few things. One was just to meet families uh, and and to start to um, ask them to archive these Skype calls and these Zoom calls. And 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 so once 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 those calls started to come in, and you sort of built this library, you you sort you could start you could start to see this story that was shaping and. And 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 from there, we were able to go back and talk to the people individually and things like that. So, it it, it was um, it. I mean, there was pressure to to uh, to get the story because you know I knew the story was going to have an end. I I I didn't know when that end was going to be. I mean, we were going to be there for the duration. Um, um, it just so happened that that the story had a natural end after the 57 days after you know we were there for that final patient getting out so we decided at that point to end the story there and dr chevalier can you tell me about that day when the hospital closed what was that moment like so the oh, dancing the doctors, doctors. <laughs> yeah the last patient um you know we we made a big deal when when the first patient left the hospital we made a big deal i'll, I'll tell you and most of us um uh, I think I, I had for every patient that left, um, and we we made a big deal. We made a big procession of patients when they left, and we all clapped them out of the hospital and helped them onto the the ambulance bus. Um, and you know, some of them were lucky enough to have family uh, to come and and see them for the first time, uh, getting back on the bus. And that last day, the last patient that left, actually, we had the music playing. Uh, one of them, he was a young man and he liked certain music. And so we played the music and I, I will say we turned it up quite loud in the gym, um, in the inside the field hospital, the gymnasium. And uh, and, then, and then they put them on that. And then we just, I don't know, I just broke out into dance and I just danced down the hallway. And then Dr. Kinnett was there and our pharmacy technician. It was so much fun. It, it, anyhow, it was an exciting day. It was an exciting day. Yeah. That moment meant what to you? What, say that again? That moment meant what to you? Oh, you know, it was a, a great sense of accomplishment. Um, it really was, uh, it was, it was, it was joyous to actually know that what we did and uh, that our, we did a good job. We did a good job. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I, physicians, I can't even imagine the sacrifices uh, you've all had to make um, to make sure that we stay safe being away from your families and this on and in those early days i think the fear must have been heightened um mm -hmm. what do you what would you like for people who are not in your position um working on the front lines in hospitals what would you want us to know oh i think that covid19 is a beast i think that people have to have great respect for it i've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of death. Um, I've seen a lot of disability from it. I've seen a lot of um, tragedy, actually. So um, it, it's a terrible disease. It's a terrible virus. Um, some people get away lucky, and it's unpredictable. There's very minimal symptoms. And um, you know, we just had a friend die just just the other just yesterday, actually. So I, I, I think it's a terrible disease and I think people need to really listen to public health measures. We need to um, get a vaccine. If you're able right now to have a vaccine, that's wonderful. Um, but we still need to mask, we need to social distance, we need to wash our hands, we need to not go to work when you're sick. I think we need to be very respectful of this virus. And although I'm hopeful, I'm, you know, I'm a little, I'm, 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 I'm cautious about, uh, you know, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. So I think people need to be very, very cautious and respectful of this virus. Um, Gordon, for you, Matt, um, says, uh, this is perhaps your best work, fabulous. Can you speak to the challenges in the editing process? Um, the film, the, you know, 
the film came together pretty easily because I mean we had such strong material I mean I had I had my mother's story and, and my dad's story and and, and that was that was uh, great and then and then and with and then with the other um, you know people in the film but I think I think once once the I think the only missing part of the film was after we got through those 57 days was the sort of perspective from the doctors and the nurses and the, and the, and the staff there. And so once I had that and I could sort of interview them about those 57 days and the patients in there, I think, I think it, 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 it was, it, it sort of tied the whole story together nicely. I thought. Um, by the way, your mom and dad are relationship goals as the young people say, <laughs> hashtag. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of people want to know how is your mom and dad doing? Uh, they're doing good. I mean, I mean, I mean, they're both vaccinated now. Um, my dad's back at Heron Terrace and, and, you know, he's, you know, the dementia is still there, but he's, he's, uh, you know, he's happy and he's vaccinated and he's safe. Uh, and, and uh, so we're, 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 I mean, we're very fortunate. I mean, we're going through the same thing that everybody else is going through just the isolation. So we're hoping that will end, you know, soon, but um, you know, we're just happy that we can, you know, still talk to him. Um, I have a question from Anonymous, and this is for both of you. What are the poignant memories you will keep from this experience? Uh, doctor, I'll start with you. Oh, I have a lot of them. I have, I have very, some very specific memories about uh, patients that were very touching moments uh, that I shared with them. Um, or or just, just funny things that patients did that day after day after day kind of made me laugh. Um, uh, and I have great moments of working with different staff members where you just shared a, something very sad together, actually. Um, I, I do, they're almost innumerable. Um, I remember, um, you know, Matt and the group were videotaping our last day, actually. So, you know, we had done the hallway dance and the patients left and, and we were leaving and Matt and his crew were actually videotaping and, and filming us out the outside and we were all going to leave. I mean, we've been very intense. We've been together for 58 days um, of very intense emotional stuff. And, and I remember I just said, I, I can't leave with those guys filming me because I have to hug all these people and it's going to be emotional. So Jonathan fortunately went out and said, you know, can you guys just don't film this? <laughs> and I remember Dr. Kinnett and I, we had a very hearty hug at the end of that out outside and, uh, before we left and, and quite a few tears, I think. We were, it was, it was very, I have lots of great memories. Yeah. And you, Matt? Um, well, now that I'm hearing Dr. Chevalier's story about what a great moment that was and I didn't get it out of my camera, that is going to, <laughs> sort of, that's going to, that's going to haunt me. <laughs> like, that was the moment. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to forgive Jonathan Foster for doing that. He came over to me and I, and I, and he's been really nice to me through the whole process and very supportive of, of like, you know, like helping with the documentary. But he said, Matt, can you not film this? And I'm just like, uh, okay. Um, you know, and then, and then, and now I'm hearing Dr. Chevalier talk about how emotional it was for anyways, the film turned out. Okay. So I'm okay. It did despite that. <laughs> <laughs> the same question I to you, Matt, though. Some good films. <laughs> Um, what I'm going to remember is just this, 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 uh, this sort of lucky time. I mean, it was, a, it was lucky. It was a wonderful thing that I could spend that much time with my mom and well, my dad, I mean, but mostly my mom. I mean, I mean, it, it was during a time when we weren't allowed to be close to one another, but you know, me and the film crew, we showed up every day at my mom's house at 8, at 8 30 AM with our camera and our tripod and our microphones and and we and we and we rolled up and we uh, we uh, opened the window and my mom sat there and we waited for the call from Dr. Chevalier or, doc, or Dr. Knett and and uh, and then eventually my dad would call so we so in 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 between those you know those 10 minute phone calls there was there was hours of us just waiting and and inevitably what we start doing is having these discussions with my mom you know and she starts, you know, hauling out the old family photos and talking about stuff. And, 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 and I, I wasn't sure if, if, if that stuff was ever going to make it in the camera or make it into the documentary, but I rolled the camera anyway, just to, just to be sure. And well, sure enough, it made it in. I mean, it's, it's, it's like one of those things where, um, yeah, I, 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 I sort of decided to capture all those moments, but 
I guess the answer to the question is, 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 is I'm always going to be thankful and I'm going to remember those, uh, you know, those sort of days where I could spend a lot of time with my mom. Did you um, learn anything new about your parents through those stories that you didn't know before uh, you started making the film? I've heard the story, but what I didn't hear was the romance. I didn't hear the romance in the, in the phone calls and, and, and the little nicknames and things like that. I'm like, I mean, my dad's a football coach and, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's, 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 he's not a tough guy, or, but he's, he's a quiet guy. He, he, he doesn't say a lot, but to hear him talk to my mom and, and call her babe and, and I love you and I, and I miss you and I, and I remember this. And it was, it was nice to sort of um, see the romantic side of my parents. And he was very proud of you. Every time you spoke to him, he would say that. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it was wonderful to hear. I mean, I, 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 I can't watch that scene without getting choked up, you know? I think um, you telling the story of, I think for a lot of these families, you've given them a gift. Um, I think in those kind of situations where everything is so heightened, people are, get the opportunity to maybe be more honest with each other than they might be otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, I, know, I know one thing for sure is that the camera, uh, the, you know, the documentary camera changed, changed the way that me and my mom spoke, you know? I mean, that's, I think, I, I mean, I've always known that when you, when you have a documentary camera on your shoulder that the conversation changes when, when, when you talk to people. That's just, that's just human nature. Um, people think more about what they're gonna say and how they're gonna respond. And, 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 and if you film long enough, you get sort of past that awkward moment. But, but there was sort of, you know, there was, there, there like was a point in the film where, you know, me and my mother and my father, we've always had, you know, sort of a, you know, you know respectful and polite relationship. And, and we didn't scratch too hard at, at, the, at the surface when it came to problems and things like that. And, and that's just the way that we sort of worked as a family. But there was times in this film where, where um, I, I, I remember I was filming, I was, I was filming my mother and she had just got a call from Dr. Kinnett and, and, and there was another uh, positive test of my dad. And this was about a month in. And so my mother was really upset and she was, she, 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 but she tried to pull it together for the, for, you know, because she knew I was there and she didn't want to make me upset. So she tried to sort of hide her emotions and, and there was just this pause and, and she said, Matt, do you ever ask people in your documentaries how they feel? <laughs> and, 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 and I, and I, and I said, well, how do you feel? And then she went into this whole thing, but you know, it's, it's, it's like, like it was my mother and, and maybe I didn't want to scratch too hard at the surface and scratch at that sort of so so it, it it actually took her to ask me to pose the question to her so she could talk freely it was it was it was a it was something i haven't seen before ever done you know and dr chevalier you know i talked to matt about this the absence of touch um, for your the, your patients that were in the hospital what effect did that have on them um, getting better uh, faster or just while they were there um, how did it impact them I think there's very good research that human touch is needed for people's mental health and to heal from physical and mental issues for sure. Um, you know, the good part for us at the field hospital is we were completely PPE'd up um, and we weren't afraid to touch patients. Whereas I think you gotta remember many had come from an environment where they had been in isolation um, in the nursing home. Um, so they were not allowed, they had not seen anybody or touched anybody, et cetera. So they came in and, you know, we, we weren't afraid to, to do that. Um, uh, and I, I think that made a big difference for them, for sure. Um, and definitely. Patients were dying. We weren't afraid to be there with them and hold their hand and, um, yeah. But that must be tough, though, because you're, you're everything to them. Yeah, I guess you are in those circumstances. We certainly were. I mean, we were, well, we were a, a, a substitute for their everything being their family, but I mean, we were doing the best we could at the situation. Um, Karen has a question for you, Dr. Chevalier. She wants to know, how did you find the transition back to the hospital after the field hospital closed? Uh, personally, I, well, we were, I was tired um, for sure, because I had worked many days in a row. 
Um, so I did need to catch up on a little bit of sleep. Um, uh, and the transition back to the hospital, um, it, it was uh, not that bad, to be honest with you, and not that different. Um, I, feel, I felt like I had gained an awful lot of experience with COVID, that's for sure. Um, and the fun part about it is that now you travel through the hospital and you see all these faces of people that you worked at the field hospital with and you feel very um, close with them. It's like their family. And I, I will tell you, and most if people are watching this um, or participating watching uh, that work with me, they know. We walk through and hey, how are you? It's, you know, and you're so excited to see them. Yeah. Tell me what's going on and what floor are you on now or where are you working? So um uh, so that is actually fun, and that still goes on today, and that's a that's a year later. That's a year later. So, uh, so it's it's um, it, it's uh, it was a transition for sure. But I think all of us enjoyed it, to be honest with you. So I, it was a good experience, and I think it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people will be surprised to hear. It, it, is my audio doing funny things? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, in my ear. Um, because I think a lot of people um will be surprised to hear that it was a good experience. Well, it was a trim. I will not kid you not. It was a very sad experience, and Matt can you know attest. When he interviewed me, it was hard to walk back into that um, field hospital. Uh, it felt I could barely get through the doors and and not feel like as if I was going to get infected. Quite honestly. Um, and uh, it was eerie walking through and, you know, the pictures are down and I, I did have to just walk through the place um, the first time I was back in there and it was, it was a little, it was very emotional, quite frank, to be frank with you. Um, and then, you know, I, it was hard for me to talk about it, to be honest with you, and not cry um, at the drop of a hat. I, I'm, I have Kleenex next to me because sometimes when I still talk about it, I, I can get very teary, particularly when I talk about about certain patients and and their families so um, i think yeah but it was an overall great experience uh, do we know how the other patients are doing yeah i mean i mean the the, like, the patients that were in the film mm -hmm. yeah um so nora is is back at heron terrace and 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 she's i i, I, I talked to kurt and 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 she's doing well and uh vinnie's doing well and and marjorie toffelmeyer is doing great too so they're all doing good that's good to hear. Um, Karen wants to know, Matt, was there anything that you were surprised about during the time that you spent filming this documentary? Um, I guess in terms of surprise, it was just, uh, you know, and we talked about it earlier, it was just the touch. <laughs> the touch became, I mean, I thought it was, I thought this film was going to be primarily about communication, but it, it just it just it just went to this one little thing of, of touch, and and touch was something that really surprised me. So it was it was that. Uh... We're going to wrap up in about uh, by eight ten. We should be wrapped up. Okay. Um, Kurt wants to give you a quick shout out and congrats for finally getting to uh, the finish line. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chevalier, anonymous says thank you for loving my mom. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Chevalier, when I went to get my vaccine, I broke down in oh, I broke down in tears. Thank you for taking such great care of our loved ones. And this mm -hmm. is from Bonnie. Um, I just want to make sure I get to as many questions in here. Um, oh, and uh, Dr. Chevalier uh, from Diane, she wants to know what are your thoughts now that the field hospital is now a vaccination center. Oh, well, I think it's great. We're going to get vaccines. So let's use it. Let's use the space. Um, let's not let it go empty and um, just sitting there. Um, the field hospital is still there if we did need it, um, of course. It, as you can see when you visit it, all the rooms are still there and it's it's ready to go if we absolutely, if, you know, if we needed it for its purpose that, uh, that we used it for. But uh, sure enough, it's great that we're using it for vaccines. So let's get, get them into people. Uh, Amy says, beautiful work, yeah. thank you. And Teresa wants to know, how has filming people that were so close to you impacted you as a filmmaker? Matt. Um, it's, this is, uh, this is not the first documentary that I, that I filmed where, 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 where members of my family are, are in it. In fact, the first story I filmed was of my uh, uncle Terry, who was, who was a, uh, 
who was the black sheep of the family and, and we did a documentary. He, he, he lived over in Detroit, but I swore after that documentary 20 years ago that I was never gonna do a documentary on another family member. How come? Um, <laughs> it's just, it was, it was so hard. And, and, and uh, Uncle Terry, you know, let's tell a quick story. He was this gifted storyteller. Uh, he, he would cross the border into Windsor and always tell us these stories about the, about the characters that he knew in downtown Detroit. Uh, like uh, Sally Finefingers and Benny the Bookie, and he had all these like great stories. And but when I put the camera on him for the first time, he he told me he didn't want to be in my documentary, so we had to sort of film around him all the time. But but yeah, but um, filming 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 a documentary on on your family is is hard, uh, you know, and and it, and it does it does uh, it uh, you know it's as I mentioned before, it's not something that I wanted to do, but now. Um, that were done, and 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 I and I and and I can show it to my mom. I, I got a call from my mom and dad. My my mom and dad watched it uh, last night at the nursing home. Yeah, and it was beautiful. Yeah, they they my my uh, dad called me and he was crying and stuff. So what did they say? What did they think of the documentary? They 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 they, they like it. Yeah yeah. They, they, That's it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, I won't push you back. <laughs> um, Annie says, uh, I had my vaccinations at the field hospital. It was the strangest thing to sit there in person after watching online my mom via the iPad for six weeks. It really choked mm -hmm. me up. Um, I'm also th thinking um, that now the field hospital probably brought the community there closer. Uh, right, Dr. Chevalier? I think you're right, actually. Um, I, I do believe that most people have heard about it, obviously, in the city. And now when they go through, it's impressive how many people will send me messages and say, hey, I saw the inside of the hospital. That was so cool. That was, you know, they, they, yeah, I do. I think it did bring people closer. I think, you know, when you rally in a community, Windsor, Matt knows, Windsor is not that big a community. I always feel like we're about two degrees of um, separation in here in Windsor. And I think that you know, uh, when something big goes down like that, we really do pull together as a community for uh, quickly. Um, and so I think, uh, I, I do think it did bring people better, um, better aligned, more aware of what was going on um, uh, to help each other. Um, coming from Toronto, Hi. where you can get lost, I'm very envious of that. Um, <laughs> my uh, anonymous says, Matt, I'm nursing some pink eye and I took antibiotics and it went away but it has seriously flared up again after watching your show this morning from tears and rubbing my eye, exquisite and moving filmmaking. That's, that's, that's quite an anonymous comment. Is that from mom? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm <Sorry>. kidding. <laughs> but I mean, hearing, um, considering that at some point you uh, almost didn't make the film and to hear that kind of response, it, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it, it, it means everything to me. I mean, at, at, at some point, during the filming, I mean, when you're making these documentaries, you're always wondering about about your audience and who's going to watch this. And and but at some at, at, at very early on in this documentary, it's never happened before. But I just sort of parked that. <laughs> you know, I just sort of uh, you know like didn't even think about like who's going to watch it or are they going to enjoy it. I thought to myself, um, I'm here. I I have a camera. There's 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 this thing that's happening and and I and I'm going to tell this story and 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 I had no idea how it was going to end but um you know for you know for my family it it uh, it uh, was something good you know so I'm, I'm glad I could film it um one last question yep because I'm so nosy uh, <laughs> uh, how did telling this story during I think you kind of touched on it but how did telling this story during a once in a lifetime event like COVID affect you as a filmmaker um, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I think, I think I'm still sort of in the mode of just, I mean, we just finished the film a few weeks ago and, and, uh, and I think, I think I need a year to sort of wrap my head around <laughs> my, my, my thoughts on that. Um, one more question. Yep. <laughs> I swear this is the last one. Um, I'm sure there are uh, creators watching, uh, there are filmmakers watching, but they might not know exactly how to navigate uh, telling stories during this COVID era. Um, what would your advice be to them? Um, you know, it's, you know, what, what we did in the film 
is we showed, I, I, I purposely showed all the sort of steps of how we did it and whether, you know, how we shot through windows and all those sort of craft things. But what, what, what was the hardest thing I think is, is sort of, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in a, in a normal time, um, when I when I ask people to be in my documentaries, it's usually a discussion that happens over weeks and months and and dinners and conversations, and we explain to each other what we're looking for, and and they they decide whether they want to be a part of the story or not, and it's a it's a, this this sort of ongoing discussion that that uh, you know it's just trying to figure out you know if if uh, if uh, they want to take part. Uh, but we couldn't do any of that this 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 time. Like everything happened so quickly, so it was it wasn't it wasn't the sort of the craft stuff that was difficult. It was it was the access and the and the sort of the asking family members who are going through something really difficult to 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 tell their story on camera. Uh, before I wrap, I just wanted to get to some of these comments, um, Dr. Chevalier. This is for you, uh, anonymous. Right, watching the video was really hard for me. It was a beautiful tribute tribute and very well done. But unfortunately, my dad did not make it once he went back to Heron Terrace. I know how well he was taken care of while at the field hospital by all of the lovely nurses and doctors, and they were also very caring. I'm happy that my father had that special care there before he passed. Thank you all so much for what you did. Mm. Um, and someone else says, uh, Dr. Chevalier, thank you for your leadership at the field hospital. Nice okay. moment. <laughs> So I think uh, we will leave it there. Um, thank you, Dr. Chevalier. And thank you so much, Matt. Um, and uh, I think Hans is gonna come back, but before everybody leaves, I would love to get a picture for social, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Hans, back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Matt and Nam and, and Dr. Chevalier for, for joining us as well. Really wonderful conversation. And uh, Matt, an amazing accomplishment of a film. Uh, congratulations so much um, uh, to both you and, and Dr. Chevalier for all you did and to all three of you for spending this time with us. Um, to all of those of you tuning in, please spread the word about the film. Uh, it means everything to everyone here uh, that as many people as possible watch this film. Um, tune in on TVO as Nam mentioned at the beginning, Tuesday night at 9 p.m spread the word, tell your friends. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And um, Nam, you want to take a picture? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Nam is frozen in time. There she is. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Right, have a good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.